This is KGW News at 5. Hello and welcome to KGW News tonight. I'm Joe Ranieri. Tonight I'm joined by our new weekend anchor, Blair Bass. Now you've known Blair for about a year now. You've been, it's almost exactly a year. Yeah, to come to next town. month it will be exactly a year. Well, we, we share a desk in the newsroom and I, I can't be more excited to have you uh, on thanks, the, uh, the weekends uh, joining me. And as we look at the forecast, we are going to be seeing some relatively quiet conditions out there the rest of your Saturday afternoon and Saturday night. You know, case in point, out in the Oregon coast, blue skies out there and very mild temperatures. Temperatures are in the mid to the upper 40s. Earlier this afternoon, we topped out close to the mid 50s, and I kind of enjoyed uh, the uh, late morning, early uh, afternoon sunshine, early day. It felt fantastic. I know it's still winter, but we are knocking on spring's door here in just another couple of weeks. In fact, it's about a week away from Monday. It's another week and a half or so until we can uh, officially ring in spring. Right now, we're seeing a temperature of 53 degrees in the Portland area, and right now we're looking at Daytime highs topping out right around the low to mid 50s. Troutdale 55 degrees, 53 over in Scappoose and along the Oregon coast. You saw temperatures right around 50 degrees. Much of us were a little bit low where we should be for this time of year, but really not by much. Now changes will be moving in heading into tomorrow morning. Of course, the big uh, news for tomorrow is uh, daylight saving time and the Shamrock Run as well. I'm also tracking some atmospheric rivers that will be hitting parts of California once again, and we are going to be seeing some of those uh, atmospheric rivers hit the metro area really tomorrow night and into Monday and coming up in my detailed forecast Blair I'll talk more about just how much rain is in the forecast and how that could impact snow levels heading into the early part of next week too. All right Joe thanks so much. Well our top story tonight people coming out of prison are 10 times more at risk of opioid overdose than other Oregonians. That's an estimate by researchers who are studying this issue. As Tim Gordon reports the study is also working to find solutions to save lives. Drug overdose, especially with opioids, is a leading cause of death among people who have recently been in prison, not just in the U.S., but around the world. A study by Oregon State University, OHSU, and Department of Correction scientists shows Oregon is certainly not immune. In fact, the study, looking at 18,000 Oregon prisoners released from 2014 to 2017, found grim results. So we saw that looking at fatal and non-fatal overdoses altogether, um, those who released from prison had about a 10 times greater rate of overdose compared to our general population in Oregon. Maybe startling to us, but not to researchers who say it fits in line with other studies. In fact, they say given the way opioid use has gone in the most recent years, the risk has almost certainly grown much greater. It's very, very, very likely that if we were to put those exact estimates into today's context with our current adult in custody population and what we have going on in the state of Oregon, those estimates are likely very, very, very conservative. What we have going on is an opioid epidemic with fentanyl leading the way, more powerful and more deadly. And for those whose tolerance is down being clean behind bars, the risk of overdose is very real in the outside world. So when they leave, they might think that they can use the same amount that they were using when they came in, or they might not have a good way of calibrating how much they can use. Um, before they're going to overdose. The DOC's Devarshi Bajpai says in the past couple years, better efforts, including medically assisted substance abuse treatment and providing Narcan for every person leaving custody, should help lower the risk of overdose. Researchers say their findings show more needs to be done to help those at risk with treatment and life-saving antidotes. So we need to make Narcan freely available in hospitals and libraries and community settings where people can take some um, without fear of being stigmatized, without having to pay for it. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Now to a chase through Portland. PPB says officers arrested a suspect today after they sped off in a stolen car. The chase ended when the suspect crashed on I-205 on the Sandy ramp. Now, as you can see there, the car was flipped upside down. Authorities say the driver was speeding when they crashed and the driver and passenger were taken to the hospital. The driver is facing multiple charges, including unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. And overnight in Portland, a driver who lost control crashed into a TriMet shelter on the corner of 20th Avenue and Burnside. As you can see, this white car is resting on its side after being crushed from several flips. The Portland Police Bureau says the driver lost control when it hit a brick wall off a nearby medical office. The driver is in critical condition and authorities took him to the hospital. As I stand before you today, 
I would like to remind you that I look healthy, but I still have more than 150 shotgun pellets in my body. A former Washington County Sheriff's deputy nearly killed while on duty and is still struggling with the aftermath addresses the man who shot him and another deputy in 2019. The shooter on Friday learned his fate. A judge sentenced 60 year old Dante Halling to 45 years in prison after he pled guilty to six counts of attempted murder. Here's Evan Watson with the story. The Washington County judge handed down the maximum sentence, saying Halling wanted to kill the deputies, and that was clear. One of the deputies that was shot, Jeremy Braun, has had a long road to recovery. A judge on Friday morning ordered a 45-year sentence for a man who shot two Washington County Sheriff's deputies in 2019. It's very clear to the court that Mr. Halling intended to kill these officers. In August of 2019, a homeowner near Hag Lake called police after seeing Dante Halling stealing guns from their shed. Deputies were searching for a suspect when Halling shot and wounded Chris Iverson and Jeremy Braun. Fire. Braun was shot in the chest and neck, puncturing arteries and leading to two strokes caused by embolisms. Braun said he had a long and painful recovery. I had to relearn to swallow, relearn how to drink, relearn how to eat, relearn how to tie my shoes, and relearn how to walk. These were skills I had mastered in the first 18 months of life. At 43, I had to relearn these skills because Dante had tried to murder me. Braun testified in front of a courtroom filled with other deputies, victims, and family. He returned to full duty after 18 months but said he couldn't stay in law enforcement due to the pain. To be clear, not a day goes by when I'm not in pain. And indeed, I'm in pain right now. Halling, who has a detailed criminal history that includes robberies and attacking Portland police officers, apologized for his actions. I do feel great remorse for what happened. I wish I could change it, I can't. There's nothing I could do to change it. And to Mr. Braun, uh, for whatever it means, I do sincerely apologize to you. Sincerely. At the hospital after the shooting, doctors diagnosed Halling with acute methamphetamine intoxication for how much meth was in his system. Washington County Sheriff Pat Garrett said Halling's sentence of 45 years in jail will provide closure for some. I think the court's decision today is a just and fair outcome. Braun didn't speak publicly after the sentencing, but he did address Halling during his testimony. I would also tell you this, I forgive you. Halling is 60 years old and has spent the last three years in jail while waiting for this sentencing. His defense attorney said he has only been trying to accept responsibility for his actions and plead guilty, but was forced to wait due to a lack of public defense attorneys. Evan Watson reporting. Tigard police have made an arrest after a fatal shooting at a parking lot overnight. Authorities say the victim died at the scene because of the gunshot wound. The suspect was detained after a short chase ending on Southwest Main Street. Now, authorities say two people were in the car when it was stopped and one of them was arrested. Law enforcement will continue to investigate to figure out why the shooting happened. Well, Portland Public Schools commemorated an important part of our city's history with the renaming of its headquarters. This after the board unanimously voted last fall to change the name. Alma McCarty spoke with educators and the family of Dr. Matthew Prophet. When families pass by the central office for Portland Public Schools or attend a school board meeting inside, they might recognize a different name now up on the sign. It's there to honor the life and legacy of Portland's first black superintendent. From 1982 until 1992, Dr. Matthew Prophet served as the superintendent for Portland Public Schools. His son, Tony, and daughter, Michelle, say to him, it was much more than a job. It's all he talked about. We would come and visit him, and he would drive us around on Saturdays, go see all the different schools, and he just, he loved his work. He was passionate about serving these kids and helping them realize their, their full potential. And we just remember how much he loved this city, the people in it. On Saturday, dozens gathered to honor Dr. Prophet and celebrate his life by renaming the district headquarters and unveiling his portrait. 
Prophet was born in rural Mississippi in a small segregated town. He attended Howard University and served in the Army for 20 years. He became the superintendent of Lansing Public Schools before coming to Portland. He passed away last year. It's really a happy moment to honor his legacy. PPS Superintendent Guadalupe Guerrero had this to say about the former school leader. As the first Latino superintendent, I can really appreciate that Dr. Prophet, as the first black superintendent, uh, fought for many of the same things. His leadership came at an important moment in the history of the city of Portland, uh, where he really amplified the importance of serving every student. Uh, he acknowledged those racial dis uh, disparities uh, and believed that every one of our students, especially our black students, uh, who haven't always been served well in public education, that they needed equal opportunities, equitable opportunities and supports. Though he served as superintendent decades ago, Dr. Prophet's family appreciates that his memory will endure. And young people and adults will walk into this building and remember and say, who was that? And someone will tell them a story. And that's just like the idea that he will not, his legacy, his impact will not be forgotten. I think that's beautiful. In North Portland, Alma McCarty, KGW News.